Caregivers, have you ever felt like nothing is going right? Well, cheer up and welcome to Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver Radio Program, where you'll learn how to avoid that dreaded thing called caregiver burnout and how to survive the grieving process. Join Dave and his guests now as they share practice tips and tools that you can start using immediately to help get you through this day. Now, here's your caregiver host, Dave Nassani. From Los Angeles and New York City, a big L.A. and Big Apple, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I am Dave, the caregiver's caregiver at caregiverdave.com, along with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg of thecaregiverspace.org. Coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on 18, yes, count them, 18 global and audio video platforms, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio, Blog Talk Radio, MixCloud, Listen Notes, Blueberry, Player FM, Podcast.com, VIP Internet Radio, TuneIn.com, Facebook Live, HealthyLife.net, and CaregiverDave.com. We're proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and one of the top six best podcasts by Caring.com, as well as number three podcast out of thousands of caregiver podcasts on Feedspot. We're pretty proud of that. And we have an exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? Yes, we do. Yes, we have here the real bionic man. Cancer, sight loss, even death can't stop him. No matter your age or background, anyone can make a living a life-saving choice to help another by choosing to donate life. Joe Lafferty, friend and coach to some of the biggest names in sports, has inspired people for 30-plus years along the way Joe's bionic process included medications, procedures, surgeries, prosthetics, machines, and life-saving organs from a hero. With decades of advocacy, a role as the ambassador of the United Network for Organ Sharing, and his position as a national board member of Donate Life Hollywood, Lafferty will reveal the simple ways people can make a difference in the world just by knowing the myths of organ donation and transplantation. Wow. <laughs> so before I in, introduce Joe, which I think I just introduced him, before I invite him, I should say, I want to thank last week's guest, Pooja Thompson, director of Roots and Wings in New York, uh, as a holistic counselor, workshop leader, and interfaith minister. And just a reminder, you can listen to that interview and this interview and all our interviews on uh, all those platforms that I mentioned before and on our membership website, caregiverdave.com. Well, enough of that. Um, Joe, are you there? Welcome to the show. Where did Joe go? He's gone again. <laughs> Joe's popping in and out. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, that's 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 why we don't do live radio anymore because there's just too many <laughs> stressful things. And being a caregiver, you know, I can't afford to be stressed out. I know you can't either. And uh, I'm sure Joe will come back. I'm sure. Anyway, so how are you, Adrian? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Did you get a haircut? Your hair looks yes, a little shorter than it normal. Was, it was same thing last week. Yeah, same thing? Yeah. Well, what I guess did, it's better to notice did. a haircut if you didn't get one than to not notice one if you did get one. My wife just did her hair this week for my I granddaughter. Saw. She, did I, not, she did not authorize that photo. No, she did, did not you? authorize that picture. <laughs> 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 but you know what? Uh, if I had to wait for all of the authorizations of my wife's pictures, she wouldn't have any pictures. Okay, Joe's back. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. All the things that you do, uh, all the research I've done prior, checking out the shows that you've done, I, it's such an amazing thing. Oh, you did your homework. Provide support huh? to those who provide support. So take a couple of minutes, Joe, and tell us who the heck is Joe Lafferty and why was he put on this earth? Uh, that would take more than a couple of minutes, but I can I can share it. <laughs> I was uh, I was um, I'm just a kid born and raised in Pittsburgh in the uh, the era of the Steelers. Born in the early 70s. By the age of eight, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and given a 70% chance of survival. 
great odds when you're betting five dollars at a blackjack table. But you know, your child is in danger, and you, he has a seven in ten chance of living. My parents wow. were great salesmen because they were terrified, but they never let me know it. Amazing. Well, so tell us about uh, your uh, your bionic part of Joe. It says here that you uh, everything tried to stop you, cancer, sight loss, even death. So when did this all start? Well, today it's uh, dodging hurricanes, but uh, I was uh, put on this earth as an example of people who uh, can get over things, I think. Uh, cancer at the age of eight, became insulin-dependent diabetic at 13, still played high school and college football, and then went on to work in pro sports. Then at the age of 29, my health took a bad turn while working in Dallas for the Cowboys. I had got a staph infection from a bad scratch on my head, and I uh, lost my left eye to a staph infection. Uh, wow. Then I went back to Pittsburgh. I went back to Pittsburgh, my hometown, which is known for uh, football and health care these days, and because things were about to get bad. Uh, I suffered a pulmonary embolism. My organs huh. failed. I needed, uh, you went I needed from bad a double to worse. valve replacement. Pardon me? You went from bad, oh, yeah, to, bad worse. to worse. Wow. So I needed a, a, a two, double valve replacement. That was July of 08. And three days later, while still in the hospital, I flatlined and was down for seven minutes while the team oh, at wow. UPMC brought you me back. You were dead for seven minutes? <clears throat> wow. What uh, did you see I, I, when I, you were I, dead, I, I Joe? I want to know. Uh, I, 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 joke, I, I jokingly say I should have started lying about it years ago, but the truth <laughs> is I remember signing to the anesthesia Friday morning and then waking up and questioning my father why he was in the recovery room, but it was actually six days later. I have no memory for six days. No memory, huh? None. none. Interesting. Well, so let's talk about caregivers. We're talking to caregivers here. Uh, our audience are burned out caregivers. What role did caregivers play in uh, your many recoveries? Because you had cancer at well, the age of eight. You had loss of an eye at the age of 29. And uh, transplant at the age of 37. My gosh. Is, yeah. How old are you now? I see these at, not at 12 or 11. It says cancer at the I age of eight. Yeah, cancer at the age of eight, diabetes at uh, oh. 12. Diabetes 12. You left that yeah. one out. And what, uh, how old are you now? I'm, uh, as of yesterday, 47. 47. You know, I used to be 47. <laughs> <laughs> I Me remember too. it well. <laughs> Nothing hurt in those days. All right, go yes. ahead. Enough about me. Well, uh, you know, when I was eight years old, I moved back to Pittsburgh. Thankfully, I had and my father, uh, uh, they were divorced, and they divorced my early 20s, but when I came back to Pittsburgh, uh, they were already good friends, but they kind of huddled me and my stepmother, Mary, as well, and they really provided me with everything. It was quite the journey uh, for me as a, a man to then with my father and realize that, you know, I didn't have a lot in common, but I realized one day, and that's a kind of a pivotal moment in my book where I realized my dad's always been there for me and he's always been the kind of caregiver to not let me rest on my loyal laurels especially if it's in a recovery situation where he wants me to push a little harder every day and if I can't Good push it's uh, he was your coach day. yes he's was he coach involved in you coach. writing your book just in time a memoir of faith and the fight of for life he was interviewed for it along with my mother and my sister, who also provided a lot of care over the years, along with a couple friends of mine and then some of the celebrities that I uh, have, that have forged personal relationships with. Now, how did you know these celebrities? What business were you in? I worked on, well, different ones for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I was tw when I was 13, I met Dan Marino as I was Dan an Marino. advocate for the Le Leukemia Society of Pittsburgh. And I got to know him on a personal level and just always stayed in contact. I met uh, Art Keo and Bucky Dent while working in sports, side of sports. And I'm then uh, sports I, was people. High school. Well, I was coaching high school football when I met all the other NFL guys. They came mm. through the high school where I coached. Yeah, uh, were they um, 
you were working in high school and you met the NFL people. Were they scouting for talent? Is that why you met them? No, I coached them. We, I, I, I come from a very successful high school football program outside of Pittsburgh, oh. and uh, we, yeah, we've coached uh, fourteen guys that have gone to the NFL. Uh, it's, you coached it's fourteen guys home. that went to the NFL. Not, over twenty-five years, yeah. 14. Over twenty-five. Oh. Well, they made it. I mean, eventually. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Wow, that's, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. That's impressive. Do you, do you get an award for that or something? Uh, well, I'm not the head coach. He, uh, the head coach, George Novak, uh, right. he's like a father figure to me. He has a lot of awards, and he deserves every single one of them. He coached for almost 50 years mm. uh, in and around Pittsburgh. Well, that's pretty awesome. So uh, I, I would, I, I would say George's best award was uh, a couple summers ago when he went to Canton and was recognized in the Hall of Fame speech of Jason Taylor as the man who introduced Jason to football. I, I, yeah. I, I would say that was one of the big moments of George's uh, college career, or uh, coaching career. So obviously you had a lot of physical issues all throughout your life. Uh, any mental issues? Yes. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, it was during the time when I exhausted my own donors. My sister, my father... Reverend David Paul and my good friend Bill Curry all offered me their kidneys, but no one was the correct match. And I, I was going to have wow. to wait for a deceased donor. And it was that time when I realized I was clinically depressed. And I turned to my friend, Reverend David Paul, who's also a psychologist, and I told him I needed to talk to someone. And I spent, uh, I spent about six months talking to a therapist because I didn't, I, I was dealing with this pre transplant guilt. I didn't want someone else to die, so I ha so I would live. Mm. Well, that seems pretty rare that every single member of your family did not have a kidney that would match yours. Uh, how rare is that? Not rare. Well, my father. Not rare. My, my, yeah, my well, my my uh, my mother wasn't the right blood type. My father, uh, it came down to tissue typing, and my sister blood had back to back. Preg yeah, and my sister had back to back pregnancies, and. Uh, mm -hmm. She had two kids. Her, her kid, my niece and nephew are 361 days apart. Pregnant. And during her second, during her second pregnancy, they were. She was on a watch for uh, gestational diabetes. And when they heard that, mm -hmm. they diabetes. said, "Sorry, we can't take your kidney." Uh, yeah, so she really didn't get past the question. I just saw an article in in the paper somewhere. I think it was on the internet that. Um, America, American doctors are very, very picky about the transplant, like kidneys, hearts, and that other countries are not. And so there's a debate. Um, is it better to be picky or is it better to not be picky and try to save more lives? Because the logic is, well, you know, we might save more lives by lowering our standards, by, by giving transplant, because they throw a lot of hearts away, they throw a lot of kidneys away because, you know, they aren't good matches or they don't think it's good enough. And the people who are waiting die. So is it better to, uh, and I'll ask you this question because you're in a pretty good position to answer it, is it better to lower your standards and try to help more people so they don't die and let them take their chances? Because, you know, uh, if I'm about to die waiting for a kidney and they find one but it's not great and my odds are 50-50, I'm willing to roll the dice. What's your opinion on that? <clears throat> Well, that, that study was very enlightening, and it uh, definitely was well-received amongst the organ donation community. And the answer to your question is yes. Uh, hospitals, sadly, are judged um, on uh, certain survival rates. So they are in a position... Uh, they're in a, posi in a position where they have to watch their survival rates. Yeah, that's why they're picky, because they don't want their numbers to look bad, because then they've got a problem. So they're, they're, I think both sides need to give a little. I think I, I think they could be, they could yeah it's 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 one of those things that's not a it's not a binary question or you know it's not one yeah. way or another that it it needs it needs a better system both sides need to give a little bit more and those are just my opinions and no 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 one else's but I I know other people in the organ donation community want more transplants the doctors want to yeah. transplant more organs but sometimes as you know in your vast knowledge of all kinds of illnesses and things they worry about survival rates three and five years out and rejection 
Yes. Yeah. That, that's all. That's all. That's all. That's 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 also um, a, a part of it. You know, once once you uh, once you have an organ, blessedly, I didn't have any rejection problems, and oh, that's a lot wonderful. of people I get. I, yeah. yeah. My my own my own donor family donated all of Justin's organs except his heart. His heart was damaged uh, when they saved his life on the flight in. They, they donated mm -hmm. all his organs, and I'm the only one to contact them. Uh, wow. I'm the only one to reach out to them to want to know them. And some of that has to be rejection. Some of that has to be guilt. Some people don't know what to say, but uh, they, love the, they love the people that they gave their organs to, and I, I love my yeah. donor family. So I check off the thing on my driver's license that says, uh, yeah, take whatever you want, you know, if I get into an accident. I, I'm always curious, what percentage of, of the public actually allows uh, them to take their donor, their organs? Do you know what the answer to that? Yeah. Yes. Not, well, first of all, 95% of people say they would take an organ. 95% say yes, take it. No, 95% of people would accept an organ transplant if they needed it. But sadly, around, and it depends on the state, but nationally, oh. about 51% of people are registered to be organ donors. Okay, so I misunderstood. 95% of organ people who need organs will take them, but only 50% roughly of people on their driver's license will check it. What are some of the reasons that people don't check that off? Are they afraid that uh, they're going to be disfigured in, uh, in an open casket or something? I mean, I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> no. Well, no, that's true. That, that's one Maybe of the myths. No. <laughs> the, 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 biggest myth, the biggest myth is people think if they are an organ donor that the, uh, the doctors in the emergency room won't try to save their lives. And that's just not oh. true. Only three right. people in, of every thousand people that die, only three people die in a manner which facilitates organ donation. If you die yeah. at home, if you die on the scene, if you die on the ambulance on the way in, you cannot transplant those organs. You need to get yeah, to so a hospital. It's a paranoia problem. People think that, well, if, yeah. if, the, uh, if they know I'm an organ donor, they won't uh, try hard enough to save my life. It, they thought that way about reverse mortgages too. Remember um, <laughs> that if if you uh, if you die, the bank takes your house back. So uh, some people actually think that the bank is going to send a contract out on your life <laughs> and kill you so they can steal your house away. <laughs> and I don't know, exactly. <laughs> probably not. No, but you know, people. My own donor, my own donor. He was in a car accident, sustained a head injury, and uh, they brought him. They got him to the hospital, and on the way in, he was he was dying, and and the way in, they put something in his heart to keep him alive. They get you to the hospital, they get you sustained, and then they try to wake you up. And when they couldn't wake up, Justin, they saw that he had a head injury, and that's when they start the brain apnea test. And that's when they realize that there's no brain activity and you are, in fact, brain dead. And that's when you can donate organs. All right. Well, this is a good time to take a break. So we are going to take a break. So uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. One Arm, One Leg, 100 Words, Overcoming Unbelievable Hardships, is about Charlene, a stroke survivor. Back in 1996, Charlene was a healthy, normal, very active 52-year-old woman whose amazing talents resemble that of both a Martha Stewart and a Wonder Woman. But all that changed when she suffered a massive stroke that left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Everyone who knows Charlene is thoroughly amazed at how she lives day by day, month by month, year by year, and with a smile on her face and hope in her heart that everything is going to be okay. Just hear what best-selling author Lynn Barrington has to say about it. If you think you have it bad, read this book. This is a beautiful, genuine story told from the heart. It's inspiring and easy to read. When you finish this book, you'll be able to look at your concerns in a new light. One Arm, One Leg, 100 Words, Overcoming Unbelievable Hardships. Available everywhere. And we're back with Joe Lafferty and Adrian Gruberg, my co-host. I'm Dave Sandy on the Caregiver Dave Show. Hey there, Joe. Yes, sir. Good. I love it when they're there. <laughs> so um, let's talk about your book. 
with your dad as a caregiver after your heart surgery, your relationship changed how? Tell us about that. Well, to be very frank, and uh, this isn't my dad's favorite subject because he's a, a private man, but uh, my mother and father divorced, and I took that very hard. Uh, and, uh, Before or after? I took it very hard. Pardon me? Before or after or during? Uh, no, when I was uh, when I was 22 years old. Uh, this happened when I was 22 years old, so kind of in the middle it's between being a diabetic and the problems I had in my late 20s. My parents divorced, as people do, and I took that very hard. And I, uh, in my mind and in my heart, I blamed my dad. Uh, he he raised me in a very binary world that you do the right thing or you do the wrong thing. And uh, you know, in my mind, I thought he'd done the wrong thing. I didn't. I was too young to understand the complexities of marriage, but uh, are you married? You know, so in my mind, in, yeah, and in my mind and in my heart, I blamed my dad. And right. uh, we were still, you know, he still took care. He still helped me, took care of me. But it was after uh, I died, and uh, every day in the hospital, he would come in and help me with a sponge bath. And every other day, he'd wash my hair over a bucket. And it was one of the first days that I stood up, and I was. He was bent down, literally washing my feet like something from the Bible. And he said, put your, put your hand on my shoulder. Steady yourself. And I did. And it was in that moment, that epiphany, that I thought, this has been my dad the whole time. And he's always been here. And who am I to judge anyone, especially him? And it, it really crystallized our relationship and really brought me into knowing the level of what a caregiver and what a parent does is that pure, unadulterated, in consistently consistent love and, and care that, that people like that give. So uh, it, 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 it changed everything about the way I saw my father. It's, the, it's that old line from, from uh, it's that old line from Mark Twain, you know, I left home at 15 and thought my father to be a fool. I came back five years later surprised at how much the old man had learned. Um, <laughs> I just... Much, I, it, my dad was always the same great caregiver. I just matured into realizing it. So tell us about Just In Time. Why did you write it? Well, I, I wanted it to be a testimony. Um, I've lived this amazing life, and I've had so many people, uh, caregivers and friends and family. And, um, you know, my life was saved by a young man named Justin. And I think mm -hmm. God knew that I would use that turn of phrase. I'm not responsible for Justin's soul, but I am responsible for the time I spend on this earth. And it's time given to me by Justin, therefore, just in time. But Justin not only is the, my, my organ donor and my hero, but he represents so many people along the way who have helped me with just a ride somewhere when I didn't drive or, or a kind word or a card. I'm, a, I'm, I'm half Italian, so... I have a big, loving Italian family, and then my smaller Irish side of my family, they're tight-knit, and they all send me so much love and prayer. So Justin is really, uh, he's a specific hero, but he also, his love represents all the love I've been given by all the people who cared for me and gave me care. Yeah. So Justin gave you a kidney, or half a kidney. No, he gave me a kidney and a pancreas. Is he still alive or no? Wow. No, no, no. He, you need he a kidney to stay alive, huh? Well, yeah, he, he, he donated, but they donated all of his organs. How so he was, was in an automobile gone. accident? How did he die? Yes, it was an automobile accident, and uh, he sustained a massive head injury. And how old was he, Jill? He was just 16 years old. Not yet. Uh, not, he, didn't have a, he didn't have a driver's license. So his fa his uh, mother and his stepfather and his uh, his biological father uh, they all made that tough decision right there. Uh, and Justin was a Justin was a loving kid, and he would make fun of himself. He would trip and fall in front of someone just to get a laugh out of them. Uh, mm. And uh, he he was such a giving, loving person. They knew they wanted to right away in the depths of grief that they wanted to donate his organs to save lives. Yeah. Is his picture anywhere in the book? Uh yes. It's 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 right inside the back. It's it's on the back. It's in the back. 
Wow. Absolute picture. It's so, a picture of him and, uh, and, like and picture, what he represents. It looks like on the cover there's a picture of you and a, and a football referee. Explain that. And and who Jeff uh, Schobler? Schober? Schober. Is? Jeff Schober. Schober. He's, he's my Sherpa through this process. But uh, that picture was taken 39 days after I died. Uh, I, I, was in the hosp- uh, I was in the hospital for four and a half weeks after I died. And I was coaching high school football at the time, and we had a game in Dallas. And I knew I was if I got out of the hospital, I was going to Dallas, and that's on a football field. You were field pitching in Dallas. a game in Dallas 39 days after you died. <laughs> I was I was coaching, coaching. Yeah, I was pitching, coaching. Not pitching. I, you know, I wanted to say coaching, but pitching came out of my mouth. I don't know why. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that happens. I can't explain it, but so you I were was coaching. An awful <laughs> Wow. Yeah, uh, I, I, I wanted to go with my team. You know, they'd raised money, and I'd been there with wow. them, and they had earned this trip, and I wanted to go. And it was 109 degrees on that field uh, you okay? late August. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I, stayed, I stayed upright. I probably shouldn't have done it, but uh, it, it was, I wanted to be there with the kids, and I hope to so serve you were some kind it, of inspiration. But you did it, and you, you, you lucked out. Texas in August is no picnic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. D- Dallas, Dallas in late August, early September, it, it gets well over a hundred degrees. And um, all right. But I, I made it. I made it with a couple trips back to the locker room to cool off in the air conditioning during that game. All right, so now after everything you went through, you found something you'd always been looking for but never really worked. Uh, and we're talking about uh, you met your love, Jennifer, right? Tell us about that. Well, uh, you know, through all the serious na- through all the serious medical things, I, I, I wasn't dating. It wasn't even anywhere near my mind. And six months after my transplant, I went to my 20th high school reunion. And it was the night, for, night before we were at a casino, and I walked in the door, and the first person I saw was this girl that I graduated with. And she said, well, you remember Jennifer Bruner. And uh, the, the cool thing I said to Jennifer was, uh, you didn't graduate with us because she hadn't. And she, she, we joked about it, and she said she was there seeing some friends. And she was, uh, she was, in, she was married and lived in Florida and had two great sons. And it was her and some other friends that they that inspired me to go out and get my own life. Well, uh, 14 months later, I was invited to a birthday party, a surprise 40th birthday party for Jennifer in Pittsburgh. She had come back to Pittsburgh to see some friends. And I went again, and uh, I started talking to her, and I found out that she had been through already in the divorce process the first time I re-met her, and uh. that she was... Uh, I guess I thought I figured she was single and ready to mingle at that point. So uh, I saw those pretty green eyes, and I was it started love laying first the ground. Time? Uh, well, the, yeah, it, the second time, yes, because oh, she was such, she's so kind, and she's <laughs> such the angel compared to the uh, maverick that I am. But uh, we started this long this long friendship relationship. I have family, a, f- a close friends, kind of family in Orlando, which isn't far which Jennifer's from in Florida. So we started yeah. this long distance dating, and uh, we're still together. Did we meet her in New York? Was she with you? No, that was Jeff Schober, my co-author. He was with me. He was my he's, he's oh, my okay. Sherpa through the literary process, and he was there with me. And uh, he is a sports writer and a high school teacher. And uh, a local journalist in the Buffalo area, he met the love of his life after he turned 40. So he was able to be a full-time sports guy and a teacher for years. And he's written some great books with Rob Gronkowski and some true crime. Oh. And they're growing, they introduced us. And uh, I, I, I say I went looking for a co-author and I found a brother. So uh, we still talk once a week. And how and, did you uh, find this co-author who was a high school teacher and a fellow coach and a writer? How did you find him? He wrote a book called Growing Up Gronk about Rob Gronkowski and his family. Mm. And uh, I liked the book. And uh, so Rob he'd written lots of books was, before, huh? Yes. Uh, my book was his 10th. So, this was um, his 10th book. And, okay. and, and his well, best. Yeah, you left out. Do say so. Yeah. Especially I'm, I'm if say you're friends now and you found a brother. 
Yes, uh, bro, my bro author, as I say. Your bro. But I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't know about his other subjects and his other books, but I think mine's the best for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's available on Amazon. Well, yeah, that's the only place left to buy books these days. <laughs> Barnes and Noble is hanging in there. So, uh, God, uh, you know, after all you've been through, how does someone stay positive in the face of so many struggles? My, everyone asks my wife that, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if you've been through more than her. Or she's been through more than you, but you've both been through hell and back. And uh, so how do you go through that? It's, I, I, I think it's just the mentality of what you have in front of you and what, where you want to go. Uh, you know, my dad, my mom's, like I said, 100% Italian. My dad's Irish, and I learned from both of them. My mom's a fighter, but you can't fight every day. And my dad's a, my dad's a steady guy. So, he, you know, he, he'll tell you, don't ever give up any ground. So you fight as much as you can fight, and then you st stand your ground and hold on and hold on. So don't do anything to take yourself to go backwards. Uh huh. Well, so that, 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 that sounds that, like that, a plan to me. <laughs> well, that, yeah. That, well, that, so you know, you got to make your progress. You know, I uh, when I had to get out of the hospital bed and start walking, um, I had three or four people around me helping me walk, and every day I'd want to get up and do a little more. And one morning I didn't want to get up after my bath and go for a walk, and my dad said, "No, no, you're." You're walking today. And I went, no, I I, let me just have the morning off. And he went, no, nope, yeah. you're going to go at least as far as you went yesterday. And uh, he was right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not perfectly motivated every day. But, you know, I always look, you know, uh, yeah. it was uh, Zig Ziglar who said, uh, motivation is like bathing. You got to do it every day. <laughs> your, your dad sounds like the same kind of caregiver that I was to my wife. Um, just a real pain in the butt, you know. Uh, motivating. What? You were motivating. Yeah, I was. My, the occupational therapist told me, you know, I like what you're doing because she would like yeah. want something from a top shelf, and she's reaching for it. And her mother was there also uh, at the time, living with us. And her mother said, "Oh, here, dear, I'll get that." Right? I said, "No, she needs to get it herself." And so I would encourage her. I said, "Come on, a little higher, just up on you your toes, just reach a little more." And she thought I was cruel, but the occupational therapist says, "No." You taught her to be independent. Your mother-in-law would have taught her to be an invalid. So it sounds like uh, your dad was was that kind of a of a coach, uh, was that kind of a caregiver. And thank God he was, because uh, how are you doing today? Are you like out of the woods? Yes, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing well. I still spend uh, more time than most uh, at, at, at UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh -huh. with follow-ups and some things. My a uh, couple years ago, I went uh, pacemaker dependent, so now I have a dual chambered pacemaker mm. uh, that you beats okay? every beat of my heart. Yeah, I'm good. Good. What'd you say about the beats of your heart? I now have a dual chambered pacemaker that creates every beat of my heart. Wow. But your girlfriend or wife is happy about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So what's the greatest blessing of your life if you haven't already mentioned it? Because, you know, it, it's easy to find all the bad stuff, but every cloud has a silver lining and and you know people look at me and my life and they think that i'm miserable because my wife is paralyzed and i don't have a normal relationship but you know what i'm blessed and and uh, this is just a new normal and i'm i'm probably happier today than i've ever been in my life now many people make terrible jokes and say well yeah if my wife couldn't talk i'd be happy too and i say uh okay we'll just leave that one alone but really, I'm I'm doing yeah. great, and uh, so are you happy? Are you joyful? Do you have peace? Absolutely. You know, I, I, I it's it's definitely oh. easy for me to say, you know, hey, I woke up this morning, or or I'm on this side of the dirt today. But you know, people, you look around, and you see a lot of cynicism, a lot of negativity. You're willing to fight doesn't mean you have to be negative. I'm, I, I can debate anybody on anything, probably too much, but there's to be positive in that. And uh, I actually see the struggles I've gone through and that I've beaten back as a tech. 
to my relationship with God, but also with all the people that have helped me through the years. And if, you know, uh, I was, I was talking about this relation, uh, talking about this interview today with someone and I said, the ripple of Justin's gift keeps going. So hopefully I can continue to make those ripples happen for everyone who helps me, everyone at the hospital, every surgeon, every nurse, every caregiver in my family, um, you know, all the aides, everyone who ever helped me anywhere I ever was. Um, and I, I did. Anyone you ever I touched. Excuse anyone me? Anyone you ever touched in your life. Well, you know, it's it, 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 it's who I touched, but it's really who saw me being carried along by all the people who uh, helped me. Mm. It, it's just like it's just like, and that's one of one of the chapters of my book is he he carried through. Uh, it's it's just like uh, footprints and the poem footprints. You know, when the man along the beach with God, and you know, he says to God, "Why did you leave me in these terrible times?" Because there's only one set of footprints in the sand. And he said, no, my child, that's when I carried you. So throughout my life, yeah. I've been carried through by many people, uh, by God and by many people. Those caregivers, those caregivers are those solitary uh, footprints in the sand. So what advice do you have for caregivers who are burned out, who aren't eating right, who aren't sleeping right, they're not taking care of themselves, they've isolated themselves, they have no friends anymore, they don't go to the gym they don't go to the movies. They don't uh, go to lunch with uh, old acquaintances. Uh, what? I, I assume your father wasn't a burnt-out caregiver, or was he? Well, I know he and my mother at times were burnt out, um, and they had each other. Uh, but you know, I, I have an aunt who I have a cousin who has Down syndrome, and she's in her thirties. Maybe her 40s by now. Oh no, late 30s. So I, you know, I have an aunt who has been taking care of her for 40 years, and uh, you know, it's easy to turn to behavior. But you know, I want those caregivers to know that they, they're, 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 people love them, and just because they, uh, there's someone who is loving them, and maybe they haven't shown it enough. Uh, you know the family. If you're a, if you're a paid caregiver, you know there's family out there that thinks you're valuable, and they might be bad at saying it, but they know your value. They know that they can trust you to take care of their loved ones. And if you're caring for a loved one, well, that's just what love is. Uh, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that life's easy. It's it's just it's just the love that we give each other, which is service, and that's how I I don't. I don't deserve Jennifer's love. I never deserved any of the blessings that she's brought into my life. But I am duty bound to serve her, and that's that's the way it works. And that's how love works. Love is serve. Love is is simply the same all the time. All right, but well, we're going to take another break, so we will be right back. Don't go away. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we are here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. And we're back with Joe Lafferty and Adrian Gruberg on the Caregiver Dave Show. I'm Dave Nassani. So, Joe... 
now you're involved with this uh, Donate Life Hollywood. What is that all about? You uh, talked about it a little bit. Just tell us your passion. Well, the passion with regard to Donate Life Hollywood is influencing uh, the showrunners and the producers and the executives who do TV and film to make sure that they're telling good stories about organ donation and transplantation without perpetuating any of the myths that might inhibit uh, people wanting to be an organ donor. And part of the reason there are those myths out there is you know, people believe that there's a black market for organs. People believe that if you're famous, like Stevie Wonder, you're gonna get a transplant faster than someone else. And that's just not true. Really? Well, and you know, for example, last month, or in last month, not two months ago in July, Stevie Wonder announced that he needed a kidney transplant. And he simultaneously announced that he already had a donor, a living donor, and that the, uh, the surgery would happen at the end of September. Well, people, can, people may think that he got his kidney because he's, po he's popular or famous, but he came to the table with a living donor. And if you have a living donor, uh, someone who's willing to give you a kidney, which I had friends that were and they just weren't the right match, uh, you can you can have your transplant as soon as you need it. My own uh, college teammate and friend Jason Illigus, he got a kidney from his sister, and then a couple months later, after he recovered from that, he got a pancreas transplant. So he got a kidney pancreas transplant in a different manner than I did. So it, it's not about who you are. You can't jump the list. It's federally regulated and monitored. The only way someone who's famous might have an advantage is if they went on TV and said, hi, I'm famous. Can someone give me a kidney? Which that's never happened. You know, Ann Lopez is the ex-wife of George Lopez. He gave George, she gave George her kidney. Uh, Selena Gomez, it wasn't until after the fact, she gave, uh, one of her friends gave her a kidney, gave Selena a kidney that she needed. Stevie Wonder has a donor. We don't know who it is, whether it's a friend or a, a loved one or just someone who's donating their kidney oh. to Stevie Wonder. I uh, don't know if it's a man or a woman, but someone is stepping up to donate a kidney. And th that's the kind of things that we need. Living donation is the fastest way that we can lower that number of 20 people a day who die waiting. Well, yeah, you can donate a kidney because you can live on one. And you can also donate part of your liver. And the beautiful thing about donating part of your liver is it grows back. So you oh, can really? donate... Yes, sir. You can donate a portion of your liver to someone. Ed Henry from Fox News a co last month donated 30% of his liver, and in about eight months it'll grow back, and he saved his sister's life. So partial liver living donations and living kidney, kidney donations are the fastest way that we can save more and more people. Because, like I said, only three people a day, three people out of a thousand, die in a manner that facilitates donation, and about 7,200 people a day die in America. So that's 22 people a day die in America in a manner that facilitates organ donation. So with wow. those numbers, it's, and 100, 113,000 plus people on the waiting list, we're gonna to continue to lose 20 or more people a day just waiting. Yeah, and everybody does have two kidneys, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I, well, I don't want to say that someone may have been born with one, but uh, yeah, you're supposed to be born with two. You know, I, I can't say. I know one thing is true, though. Uh, one thing with organ donation, and this is a myth, people don't know the difference between a coma and being brain dead. People can have come back from comas. No one has ever come back from being brain dead. Once, I once uh, and I, I've talked to Justin's mother, once the lights are off, nobody comes back. Uh, once your brain dead, no one's come back from that. That it means all the brain activity has ceased, and you're just uh, a, mach a person that's breathing and living via a machine. Hmm. Well, I can't believe how fast the hour has gone. I know we wasted some of it uh, on technical difficulties, but how do we get a hold of you if somebody wants to learn more about what you do or maybe even uh, ask some more questions about uh, organ donor donors? Well, anyone interested in organ donation or any caregiver that wants uh, some daily motivation, uh, please reach out to me. Go to therealbionicman.com. 
and uh, please, you can see my, you can get attached to, you can get attached to uh, Amazon. The book is Just in Time, a memoir of faith in the fight for life, written ble written beautifully by Jeff Schober and uh, 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 with an assist from me. And um, please go to registerme.org, registerme.org, and sign up for the National Registry. That allows your family to know that you want to be an organ donor. So when that time comes, it's not a decision that they have to make. They know you want to be an organ donor, and you can then potentially save someone's life. And uh, just make sure you uh, for, to participate in, in, in the process at some point. Learn what you can and uh, find someone in your yeah. community who's had an organ and find out more. Most living organ donors donate to someone they know, right? I mean, how rare is yeah. it that somebody just, like, giving blood, you know, they don't know where their blood's going, will will donate a, a kidney or a, or a, um, a liver? How, how rare there have is been that? Many, no, there have been many donations. Uh, uh, well, that they ultimately don't become uh, anonymous, but people have donated to total strangers. Uh, you know, parent, parents will hear that a teacher – and at a school that they're not even affiliated with, uh, the, the, there have been needs that have been met by total strangers. There's also wow. been chains where someone donates to someone who donates to someone who donates to someone. They've had chains up to 30 people donating kidneys so it can come back around to someone who needs one. Wow. So there are a lot of great stories. There's a lot of great stories like someone donated some, some, man, some man passed and his heart went to another man. And the man who received the heart walked his daughter, walked the donor's daughter down the aisle. And, wow. and there are some beautiful, there's some beautiful stories that Hollywood could take advantage of and tell the, and, and tell and yeah. inspire people to be organ donors. Because it's, it's a sacrifice to be an organ donor. I mean, you have to go under the knife, right? It is. It's a serious sacrifice and uh, not to be taken light, lightly. I've talked to people who have donated their child's organs and then never reached out to the recipients. And I tell them, there's no wrong way to give. There's no wrong way to save mm -hmm. a life. If that donor family doesn't want to interact with the recipients, that's okay. They've already done the hard part. Um, they donated the organ and saved some lives. So uh, just, just, get, just get out there, give, support. Yeah. Uh, make, sure you know the, make sure you know the ins and the outs before you get involved. Thank you, Joe. It was a great interview. We are so glad we met you at the uh, National Publicity Summit. And Adrian is uh, just dying to get back to the city. So uh, how do we, are you brushing the flies away, Adrian? <laughs> um, well, uh, mosquitoes uh, oh, are mosquitoes. surrounding me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mosquitoes You're like too me sweet. too. I'm, I'm like fresh meat to them. So how do we get a hold of you, Adrian? Uh, if somebody wants to know more about the caregiver space or the mosquitoes that bite you. Adrian, Adrian at the caregiverspace.org. And anything anything you want to know is there, where the Facebook page is, whatever social media we're on. And uh, the Facebook, the Facebook uh, page has a lot of communities that really will help a lot of different people. All right, and I'm caregiverdave.com. That's your one-stop shopping. Stop at caregiverdave.com and uh, get some free gifts. And if you really feel like you want to stay alive <laughs> and stay out of the hospital, since 30% of you will die before your loved ones do, and the rest of you will uh, likely become hospitalized and need a caregiver of your own, join caregiverdave.com because we like to help caregivers stay alive. So with that, I'm going to wish you all adieu, and I appreciate you coming on the show, and we will see you next time. So bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program with Dave Nassani. 